Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning. Uh, This morning in Galatians, um, I'm excited. Uh, There is so much that is going on, not only in this text, but in my heart right now. But before I get into the scriptures and uh, we go over the scripture that uh, Daniel just read, um, let's go ahead and quiet our hearts for a moment. Um, Sometimes I I know what it's like to kind of have to settle in. Uh, for me to be fully present. Sometimes it, it could be I'm, I'm sitting there and it takes a while for my soul to kind of catch up, my thoughts to kind of catch up. So let's just settle our hearts, whether you're at home or uh, whether you're outside or whether you're in the sanctuary. Let's, let's pray. Father, today as, as you still and you quiet our hearts, God, I'm mindful of your word that says to be still and to know that I am God. Lord, in our world that is so noisy with not only the noise from the outside, but the noise from our own heads, God, we pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be fully present, that we would be um, mindful of your presence today. We ask that you would open up our hearts, God, that you would bless your word this morning, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the message for this morning is keep doing good. I know that if you are a grammar teacher, it might sound like, hey, shouldn't that be keep do, uh, doing well? But it, it means keep doing good, goodness, good things. That's a, that's a noun, so keep doing good. It's not, do, anyway, I'm not going to get it. It's, it. it's keep doing good. God wants us to keep doing good things. And so welcome this morning if you are um, online Uh, The kids that are meeting, kids that are at home, um, if you are single, married, if you're a student, then welcome. I I just want to ask you to consider doing something in a moment here, that if you're watching online, to like, to share, to subscribe, to help us get the message out. Three years ago today, this morning, Billy Graham went from this life into the next in eternity. And when I think about Billy Graham, um, here is the man that has preached the gospel live to more people than any other human being in the history of human beings. Consider that. The places he's gone, the, the stadiums that he's preached to around the world with different audiences. And I, I think that when he, he died, uh, there was a question, who's the next Billy Graham? And I want to let you know that no one, no one is the next Billy Graham because God only makes one of each one of us. Um, 95 percent of Christians have never led someone else to Christ. I want you to consider that. And I also want you to think about this, that less than two percent 
of churchgoers have invited someone who doesn't know to, uh, Christ to church last year. So 2% is like the average, but in a year like 2020, it was probably a lot less. But it's a simple thing that if you're watching, you could simply share this even after the message is over. And as we get into the message, I think that if you're listening for the first time, you'll hear that there's a message of hope that God wants to give to each one of us. Regeneration Church exists to glorify God by cultivating a community of disciples who respond to the gospel. How do we respond? First of all, we receive Christ, we accept him, and then we grow in relationship with Jesus, but then we also intervene on his behalf. It means that God uses us in mission. When you think about the Great Commission, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He tells us to make disciples of all nations. This is something that God calls each one of us to do, and he wants us to partner with him. But there's an importance in doing that, that as we do it, we do it as a community, not just as individuals. When Jesus sent them out with the disciples, he sent them out two by two. We also realize that there's a part of a community where it's not just going to one person, but it's inviting other people into community with us. Last week, we looked at how community um, is directly affected by our self-image in Christ. How do we see ourselves? If you remember, we looked at Galatians 5, 25 and 26, that if we live in the spirit, we're to walk in the spirit and we're not to become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Remember the word conceited means empty of honor or empty of glory. So the person that feels empty of honor or empty of glory, there are some that are hungry for honor and so they're provoking others or that's vanity. It's like they need the approval of others to feel better about themselves. So they're exalting and lifting themselves up because they're hungry for that honor. They, they want likes, they want follows, they want people to recognize them. And in doing so, that at times it provokes others because I don't know if you've ever seen someone that gets something new or something good happens to them and they share it. You know, there's a scripture that says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Sometimes it's harder to rejoice with those who rejoice when things aren't going as well for you. But then there's another hunger for honor where there's envying and this is self-pity. Self-pity is a very dangerous thing because it doesn't feel like pride. Self-pity feels like I see myself lower, and so therefore I'm not full of pride, but pride is really considering ourselves above other people. In fact, remember this, that C.S. Lewis said that true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So my thoughts are not going to be preoccupied with self. And then Tim Keller wrote that the Holy Spirit creates a whole new self-image that is not based on comparisons with others. Only the gospel makes us neither self-confident nor self-disdaining, but both bold and humble. That works itself out in relationships with everyone. So the gospel is the only thing that addresses vainglory. It's that thing that when we receive the gospel and we understand that we are absolutely loved, and also, we don't deserve it. It causes us to be humble when we see others and we don't think that we're above them. It also causes us to be bold and we're not intimidated by others because our self-image doesn't come from what everyone else is thinking about me. Now, I'm not saying that it's not important to build people up and to help one another. And, and one of the reasons that um, I think growing up, I had this kind of sense of being loved and secure was my parents. My parents were always pouring into me, you're loved and you're secure. And so that, that translated when I became a Christian where I wasn't coming from a place of as much deficit as some other people that maybe their whole lives have been told that they're nothing or they're worthless. Remember that to be seen in the image of God means that he's created us after his own image to know him. And that means that he sees the good in us that he wants to develop and he wants to bring out. We looked at sharing one another's burdens. Interesting, when you look at Galatians 6, uh, 1, where it says, brethren, if any of you is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Um. This is a picture of someone falling from a pedestal. 
And when you think about that, they say, don't put someone on a pedestal. Um, uh, this picture has people that are down there and they're all pointing. They're all looking like, oh, look at you. Look at you. You messed up. It is so important that we are a community of grace and humility that doesn't point fingers, but seeks to restore. So when someone falls and someone messes up and someone blows it, instead of ostracizing them, they actually need someone to come alongside of them and to help them. They need a community that is filled with grace. And in our culture, it's not a grace-filled community, is it? It's a place where if you mess up, it is public and it is in everyone's face and everyone like points their fingers at you and you just feel so much shame that the shame can either cause us to be super depressed and self-insulated or it could cause us to be angry and hate other people. And so what's happened in our world without a community that is based on grace and truth, you have these communities that are popping up that are just based on grace. They're just based on, hey, you messed up and you're sinful, so am I. Come and be accepted in our sinfulness. And we could stay sinful and be angry at everyone else that's not sinful that looks at us as sinful. You have truth-filled communities that are like, look at all those sinners Come over here and let's make a stand on truth. And we're the truth community. And the truth community is better than those idiots. But to have a community that is filled with grace and truth is what God calls us to. Because Jesus himself was filled with grace and truth. And in being filled with grace and truth, I, I totally get this. Leaders have a special accountability. Let not many of you become teachers knowing that you will inherit a stricter judgment. I, I feel that weight every day. There's not, there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about that weight. And yet, when you see people like a Ravi Zacharias and what's come out recently, it grieved me so much because he's had such an impact on my life. And if you don't know, you, you could, uh, Gospel Coalition has a really good article a, about it. Uh, a guy like Carl Lentz, very public, uh, um, you know, a pastor for Hillsong and uh, Justin Bieber's pastor and, and um, like a lot of athletes and, and professional, um, you know, actors and singers, very public, very public, these, these things that happen. So here's what's important. Number one, that we keep our eyes on Christ rather than a person, okay? We keep our eyes on Jesus rather than a human being. Secondly, we need to repent, confess, and expose sin rather than sweeping it under the rug. If someone confesses openly, then there is a real possibility that that can be dealt with with people that call them to accountability and restore them. And if we're a community that is filled with the grace and love of Jesus, then it's a place where my hope and my prayer for all of us is that we could confess our sins one to another and that we could find accountability and we could be restored rather than squished and pushed down. And at the same time, it must be a community where sin is not swept under the rug. I, I, I am so encouraged when I read about RZIM, the, the ministry, one of the people they brought in to help them with this process is Rachel Denhollander. And if you know Rachel Denhollander, uh, her book, What is a Girl Worth? It, is, uh, um, it will shake you because she was the gymnast that um, was the first gymnast to bring public what Dr. Nassar had done to many of the female gymnasts on the, on the U.S. Olympic team. And people didn't believe her and people in her own church didn't believe her. And, and people told her, hey, you know what? Like, don't, don't stir up things. So it is absolutely important that we take those things seriously, that this is a, a place where we protect the most vulnerable. And at the same time, when sin is exposed, that we deal with it, call it what it is in truth, but that we seek restoration for the person that is in that place. So it's not one or the other, grace or truth, but it's both and. That's why it goes on to say, you know, one of the ways that we help one another in this community is not only when people are caught in sin or overtaken in sin, any of you that have ever been in an addiction um, um, organization or ministry, I used to work with Advent Group Ministries where um, the, the students that are there are incarcerated for drugs and alcohol. They're sentenced to be there by drug court. 
And, and when you see this community, they need help. And a lot of these young people would be in the program and just so thankful that they have some life. Uh, we took them snowboarding and it, was, it, it blew me away that they, they started laughing and they sounded like kids again. And there was this one kid, like 17 years old, hardened, drug addict, drug dealer, gang member. He's laughing and he tells me afterwards, hey, teach. He goes, this is the first time I've had fun like a kid since I was like probably kindergarten. Yeah. See, this is what God would desire of us, that we come alongside of others and we help them. And that's why it says when someone is overtaken in a trespass, but it's not the only way that we help others. You remember last week we talked about each one shall uh, bear his own load, but we're also to care, carry one another's burdens. Look at, look at what it says there. Verse two says, bear one another's burdens. Verse five says, each one shall bear his own load. A burden is something that's too heavy for you, but each one shall bear his own load. That's really the picture of the backpack. It's suited to you and what you can carry. And if you're not carrying your own weight, it puts more weight on others. And this is what we're going to see in the scripture that we get to today. When we keep doing good, we need each other to do our own part and to also trust that the other person is going to do their part. Um, now, I, I, I don't know what you think about the New England Patriots. I'm not going to go there, but I will say this. Bill Belichick has this system that has been in place, which is a thing where everyone comes and the, the, the anyone know the phrase that they say? Do your what was that? Job. job. They all show up and that's it. If you're a quarterback, do your job. If you're a guard, do your job. If you're a receiver, do your job. If you're an assistant, everybody just do your job. And when everyone does their job, they're all carrying their own load. They're all doing what they're supposed to do. The team can go forward. And the same thing is true for the body of Christ. We're all to bear our own load. And if we're not all bearing our own load, it becomes heavier for other people that are doing double time or triple time or carrying an extra load. If you've ever seen the Navy SEALs, when they carry the logs above their heads and one of the, you know, they're just, the taller guys are struggling because they're bearing more load. The shorter guys are struggling because their shoulders are pressed and they're holding the log up like this. But every single person needs to be pressing against that log with everything they have because if they don't, it becomes heavier for everybody else. And when one person doesn't do their own thing, then sometimes it causes tension. Sometimes it causes the, the log not to get there, the mission not to be accomplished. There is one load, however, remember this, that none of us are to carry on our own. And it's in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins on his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. So therefore, the reason why we could bear one another's burdens at times when they're weak or they're sick or they're having a hard time is because we realize that in grace, Jesus has bared my burden upon himself. And so who am I to be self-righteous and say, I'm not gonna help you because you're not carrying your own weight. Because if God did that to me and he said, okay, Matt, you carry your own weight now. I'm just crushed. I'm squashed like an ant immediately. So God calls us to bear one another's burdens. And now here we get into the shared mission in verse six. And this is the new material that we're looking at. In verse six, it says this. It's speaking to teachers and to learners. It says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Okay, so this morning, I'm teaching the word. Uh, Dana is in the back. She's teaching the word with the kids. Um, on Tuesday nights, Reeve is teaching you know, youth. So there's different teachings that go on. Know this, that I also receive from you guys. I, I receive a lot. Um, it's an amazing thing that if you are trying to learn, you could learn from anyone. Uh, you could have a terrible teacher, and if you're trying to learn, you can learn something. But let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. 
This is a, a picture at a, a Calvary Chapel pastors conference with my two pastors. My, my um, pastor growing up was Raul Reese. So from the time I was like five, six years old until the time that I moved from Southern California to Northern California, I was at Calvary Chapel West Covina and then Calvary Chapel Golden Springs with Raul Reese. Um, I've seen his impact on my brother, on my sisters, on our family. Man, heavy, um, before my mom passed away, she wanted to get a message to Raul and she said, Raul, thank you, Pastor Raul, because you've had such an impact on my sons and on my daughters and on our family. So moving up to San Jose, Don McClure uh, became my pastor. When I got up to San Jose, it was uh, funny, before I was there, when um, I was in, doing ministry at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs, they had us listen to a tape. It was affectionately known as the Navy SEAL training tape. It was called The Ministry of an Assistant by Don McClure. And I remember listening to that and hearing it and telling Deanna, I could never work for that guy. There's no, there is no way. Like intense. It was just, it was just too intense. And then God sends me up and I, I work in San Jose and I learned and I gleaned and I appreciate so much that I learned. The way that both of these men have integrity, the way that they handle the word of God, the way that their hearts are to serve the Lord no matter what in different circumstances. And if I'm to share in all good things with them who have taught me, what does that mean? Well, part of it is financial. In, in, the, in the scripture here in the context, uh, most of the time when this is taught, it, and it, it is true that there's a financial part of support. Later on, Paul will talk about like the church in Philippi was such a sending church that sent him on missions to other churches. So those other churches weren't burdened because the church in Philippi was sacrificially helping. I, I want you guys to know it, it's such a blessing that there is not only a shared um, financial burden, but there's a shared reward. Remember that when David and the men went out to fight in one of the battles, some of the men were so weary that he said, you stay back and you guard the supplies. And then when we have supplies, we come back and you guys are the supply line for the front lines. David and his men, they win the battle. They come back and they bring the spoils of the battle with them. And the, those that stayed back are, are there with the supplies. And some of the men who went to the battle said, don't share with them. They stayed back. They didn't come with us. So they don't get any of the share from, from what we received. And David said this, those who stayed with the, the supplies as well as those who went will share equally. Now, the reason why I share that with you is that there's a reward and some people are senders. That in that prayer and in that financial support, we, we give about $3,300 a month. In most months, that's the average to other ministries around the world and also to here in Santa Cruz County. So that's for Foster the Bay. That would be towards uh, like Teen Challenge. That would be like ministry that's in the Philippines, uh, uh, the Jedlicas who are in El Salvador and in Chile, like different ministries that are happening all over the place. And I just want to let you know that if you are those that are sending by giving, you share with that reward with those that are on the mission field. You share with not only the weight of responsibility, but you also share with the mission. And I want to encourage you in this. If you're to share with those who teach, it means that you're to share also the mission. We all share the mission together. Um, I, I have a, a, a good friend who is kind of related to me in a way, uh, Fred Hennis. He pastors Gateway Bible Church. Just if this dead end, this cul-de-sac were open, it would go right into their church. And he is Nate's father, um, our son-in-law, Nate, who married our daughter, Rebecca. Um, this fall, Fred is going to retire. And that's public. Um, he's, he's going to, to retire. Um, and I just told him, there is going to be some church that is going to be so blown away when you just show up. And you and Meredith are sitting there in that church and all of the experience that you have and all of the ministry and all of the background and you just, just show up at that church and like, where can I help? 
See, we all share in the ministry. It's not only those who are um, in, in a position in a church. We, we all share the ministry of the Great Commission. We're all to share the ministry in the workplace. One of the things that we have not done as good of a job as we need to and we want to emphasize is to train people for ministry in the workplace. If you work at a certain place, you go to school, you're going to reach people there and that's an incredible mission field. Those are people that will see you every day. Those are people that are next to you and they'll watch how you work. They'll watch how you treat them and they'll listen to what you say and they'll see your life. And you may have an opportunity to share with them in ways that a pastor or a youth pastor can never do. So we share with those who teach. We also get to share the blessing of someone come to Christ. We get to share the weight of the responsibility to minister to others. One of the things that we are praying about, and I'm excited this year for Easter, just a, a precursor thinking right now, our world absolutely needs hope. If there ever was a time that people need to hear hope, it's right now. And just as things are opening back up that for Easter, um, we're planning to be in the Redwood Grove and people that wouldn't come inside would be outside possibly, People that don't normally come to church, that's an opportunity to teach. It's an opportunity to minister. It's an opportunity to share hope. But if we do that, we're going to need about 50 volunteers that are just setting up and tearing down and, and doing all of these things. And really, that's the model. We've, we have never wanted to have a church where people say 10% of the people do 90% of the work. That's not, that's not the model of the book of Acts. The model is that each one of us is a minister and some minister in other ways than other people. So I want to encourage you that we're called to share in all good things with those who teach. And let me also um, say thank you. Thank you for supporting the work of the ministry financially, in your prayers, in notes, in, in encouragements. I'm, I'm telling you that a word of encouragement goes a long way. The average pastor leaves ministry statistically because of six people. That <laughs> means there's, there's like six people that are just needling, just like hammering and, and the discouragement can set in. Um, and you guys all know this personally, right? If you hear 10 words of encouragement and one word of criticism, what do we latch on to? We just latch onto the criticism. So just thank you for being a very encouraging, I am super blessed I absolutely, absolutely am. Um, Santa Cruz County, you could pray for all of the pastors in Santa Cruz County. The average life expectancy of a, a pastor in Santa Cruz County is like a running back in the NFL. It's just like, you just keep getting pounded and pounded. So I uh, just want to encourage you in that. We share the mission with one another. Uh, we, we share, and then we also grow where we're, we grow what we plant. In verses seven and eight, Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Don't be deceived. Um, we will reap what we sow. The deception is what I do today won't affect tomorrow. What I'm doing at age 15, it's not gonna affect me at age 30. What I'm doing at age 30, it's not going to affect me at age 40. The way that I'm living at age 40, it's not going to affect me in my 60s. We're deceived if we think that what we do now will not affect us later. And sometimes we need the perspective of people that are older than us to say, you know what? You have never been 40, but I have been 30 and I have been 20 and I've been 15 and I've... And so sometimes we need that perspective in an intergenerational ministry. It's so absolutely important. First Peter 4.17 says this. So if we only think this, oh, you're going to reap what you sow, that, that's for those that are not following the Lord. Listen to First Peter 4.17. It says, for the time um, has come for judgment to begin at the house of the Lord. So judgment begins here first. And then it says, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? 
So none of us is outside of the law of reaping what we sow. And by the way, what that means is that to sow means to plant seeds. Reaping and sowing. For those who do not obey, which means believe, put your hope and trust in the gospel, um, there is a reaping that God will say eventually, if you want to be separated from me, then I'm going to let you do that. And I'll let you spend eternity away from me. For those that are following the Lord, we also reap what we sow. And we realize that in this life, we're missing out on so many things at times. But it also works conversely on the good side. See, too many times we only think of reaping what we sow as a warning that bad things are going to happen. When I was working at Advent, I had this student named Eric. Um, If Eric were at a public high school, I, I really believe he would be um, Division two, maybe a Division one football player and possibly basketball player. This kid was an amazing athlete. Uh, grew up in Richmond, um, and he was a shot caller when it comes to gangs and drugs. And he was, this, this was the guy that um, all of the other students that were there incarcerated, you, you kind of, he was the shot caller, at, and everyone knew that. Everyone could see that in Eric. And so if a new kid came in, um, like eventually, like the staff would try to catch Eric doing these things, but eventually they're paying Eric through food, through like uh, passes, different things, because Eric has that kind of power. One day in class, I I looked at Eric and uh, I had built a relationship with him. I really enjoyed teaching him. And I looked and he was in the back and he had his hand over his head like this. And so I'm teaching and I'm looking at him and, and so I'm not trying to draw attention to him, but I, I just see tears start to hit his desk. So I get the students working. I'm like, hey, you guys go ahead and work on this. And I tap him on the shoulder and I just, you know, I don't want to draw attention to him. So I just tap him on the shoulder. I walk towards the door and I, I, I give him this motion like, come here. So he walks outside with me. And I'm like, what's going on? So Eric's mom, uh, he found out while he was incarcerated that his mom had AIDS. And he did not know if he would get out to see her. He also thought about like his life and he thought about like all these things. And he looked at me and he said, teach, I've been trying to, I've been trying to do good things. I've been trying to do things right. I'm trying to follow the rules and look at all. And he's just like pouring out his heart, all these bad things that are happening to him. I said, Eric, how old are you? He said, I'm 17. I said, how many years have you been planting bad seeds? He said, 17 years. I said, so for 17 years, you've been beating people up, you've been robbing people, you've been dealing drugs, you've been doing all of these bad things. I said, how long have you been doing good? He said, it's been a couple of weeks now. (laughs) And I said, for two weeks? I said, look at this field. So we're out there in San Martin area, you know, in the South County, and there's just this giant field that we had, and we played sports in that field, and there's weeds growing up all over. I said, Eric, you see all those weeds out there? Those weeds, that's what's been growing up in your whole life for 17 years. And you're starting to plant seeds of, of good stuff so that what grows is like this field. And for 17 years as you've been planting bad seeds, and you've only been planting good seeds for two weeks, you've got to know that if you keep planting good seeds, good stuff will grow. And you can't be discouraged during the time of planting because it's going to take some time for you to start seeing the good stuff. I was very careful with my words. I didn't say plant grass because he would have planted grass. Uh, So I just said plant seeds by grass. I meant pot anyway. um, So reaping and sowing. Um, we, We will reap what we sow. So whatever you plant will grow. If you plant good seeds, it's going to grow. You plant bad seeds, it's going to grow. We could, uh, we could sow to the spirit or we could sow to the flesh. We could sow seeds of faith, love, and truth, or we could sow seeds of destruction. How do we do that? We do that by the way we talk to people. The way that you talk to your kids, if you tell them you're good for nothing, you'll never amount to anything, you're just planting some bad seed. But when you say, I know that you don't see it yet, but God created you in his image and he loves you 
and, and he will never let you go. You're planting seeds. You might not see them grow right now, but you're gonna see them grow later. And so when we think about planting these seeds, planting seeds at home, planting seeds in your business, what you do, if, if you spend all of your time at work, your work might grow. Your job, your business might grow. But if you're not planting good seeds at home, then that's not gonna grow. And that's where we need the Holy Spirit because we also, we do need to work. We need to go to school. We need to do all of these other things. But we will reap not only what we sow, but we will reap where we sow and ministry everywhere. My prayer is that we plant seeds wherever we are, that some of the greatest seeds that will grow are, are not necessarily ministry things at a church, but ministry things outside of a a community of God's people, so that those seeds that are growing will grow up and good things. Now, notice I said, we will reap what we sow, we will reap where we sow, but we will not reap when we sow. Sometimes our discouragement comes because we're not reaping. That's Eric's, Eric's life. He wasn't reaping when he was sowing. Sometimes the sowing happens now. We're in planting season, and the reaping happens seasons later, sometimes years later. And sometimes seeds, just like certain types of trees, where that seed could lay dormant until maybe it's a fire that causes it to open up and then it gets planted, a flood, something will cause that eventually to germinate. So maybe you haven't seen the growth in what you've planted yet. Take some advice from Albert Einstein, who is a pretty smart guy from what I understand. He said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. We're all building compound interest. It just depends on what we're investing in. It all depends on what we're doing. And I want want stuff to last for eternity. So that means I have to set my mind on things that are going to last forever. Here is a a graph. there's a guy named Hogan from uh, Dave Ramsey's uh, group. Here's here, this incredible picture. Investor number one starts at age 25 and sets aside $5,000 a year for 10 years in a row. When investor number one gets to age 34, investor number one never invests anything else. So just from age 25 to 34, and then they just stop. Investor number two starts at age 35, invests $5,000 each year for 30 years in a row until reaching age 65. And I want you to see the gap between investor number one and investor number two, 787,000 to 611,000. The earlier that we start to invest in good things and spiritual things, the more that it reaps later on in life. That's why when I was 16 years old and I went to a men's retreat with my brother, and my brother-in-law Ray, my brother-in-law Rick, and my dad, and we're sitting there and I'm the youngest guy at this men's retreat and we're in Big Bear, California and we had been up all night and we were in stadium seating, kind of looking down and the, the, the teacher, the pastor was down there looking up at us and I am falling asleep and I am, I'm just like, like some of you, like I... I I know like that feeling, like you're just trying to stay away. Sometimes I I empathize with you. I'm teaching, so I won't fall asleep. I'll never fall asleep when I'm teaching. Uh, But like, I know what it feels like to have your, like, and my brother, my brother, they're they're laughing. They're behind me like, Matt's about ready to fall asleep. So I fall asleep and I fall out of my chair into the aisle, (laughs) into the aisle. And we're sitting, I'm in like the third row. I'm down there on the floor on my, my I, I fell down, I look up and, and the teacher is looking right at me and everyone's laughing. And so I get up and uh, I was super embarrassed and my, it, was, it was great because the whole time my brother, my brothers, and they're just laughing, they're behind me, they're making fun of me. So after the thing is over, after the meeting is over, we're out there and there's snow, we're, we're throwing snowballs and, and this guy comes at me and he says, he says, why are you even here? So this is an older guy. I'm 16 years old. You know, I'm just like a kid at this men's retreat. He's like, why are you even here? And I didn't even hesitate. I said, because just like that, I'm going to be 35. And I said, I want what I do now to count for what happens then 
And he was just like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> like, it, was, it was great, you know? Like, but that's, that's the truth of it, compound interest. C.S. Lewis said this, good and evil both increase at compound interest. That is why the little decisions you and I make every day are of such infinite importance. The smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months, from which, uh, let's see, let me get to that. It's like, it's going way ahead of me. One more. There we go. So the smallest good act today is the capture of a strategic point from which a few months later, you may be able to go on to victories you never dreamed of. An apparently trivial indulgence in lust or anger today is the loss of a ridge or railway line or a bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack that would otherwise be impossible. That hits me. Oh, it's no big deal. It's just a little bit of pornography. It's no big deal. It's just a, a small lie. It's no big deal. How do the big deals happen? They happen with a bunch of little deals. A bunch of little deals that are ignored over time, that are kind of brushed over. And we deceive ourselves when we say this, I will have integrity in the big things. The little things don't really matter. And Jesus says, if you're faithful with the little things, then God will entrust you with greater things. And we have to realize that every decision that we make are times that there are ways that we either grow stronger or weaker. And therefore, it is absolutely important that we do not give up. It says in verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good. See, there's the doing of good. For in due season, we, will, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We will reap if we don't lose heart. So don't grow weary in doing good. The very good thing that you think, man, I keep loving this person and sharing about Christ by my example and by the words that I say, and I'm not seeing the fruit of it. Don't grow weary. Don't give up. If you see in your life, you're trying to start the year reading the word of God. You're trying to have a quiet time. You're trying to have a devotional time, a, a time when you're growing and, and you can't get consistent. And it seems like it's been like a week, which turns into a month. And you said you were going to do that in January. And now you just feel so discouraged. Do not give up. The person that like my dad for years, when my brother became a Christian, my dad beat him up, kicked him out of the house my dad um, persecuted, literally went to the church with a gun that he didn't expose, but he didn't know if it was a cult. And he came to take my brother and my sisters out of the church meeting. And my brother said to him, dad, if you don't want us to go to church, we won't go to church again, but you can't tell us to stop following Jesus because dad, Jesus loves you. And that's when my dad just lost it. So when I became a Christian, I was five years old, maybe six years old when that happened. When I was in college, it was at that time when the Lord was, had already stirred me to be praying for my dad, to reach out to my dad. I started getting real discouraged because I thought my dad's never going to become a Christian. I started having dreams where in my dream, I was at my dad's funeral. And at his funeral, I was weeping because I knew he didn't know Christ. I knew he was going to be separated from God for eternity. I knew that if I died, I would never see him again. And as my heart was so wrenched for my dad and began to pray for my dad, there was a, a girl on our missions team in Mexico that said, Matt, get your dad to church on Easter because I think God put it on my heart this year is the year. So I began to pray about it and Deanna was with me and we invited my dad and, and to my surprise, my dad said, yes, I'll go. It was a sunrise service, 5 a.m., Citrus College. Picked up my dad. We go over to the sunrise service. We're out there. Raul Reese is giving the message, and my dad is getting super nervous. My dad was 67 years old. And at that, on that day, Raul said, it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, and right now you might be nervous, and you might feel your heart beating inside of you, but God loves you, and there's nothing that you've ever done that is so bad he won't forgive you. He still loves you. And Deanna looked at me, and she said, do you think your dad wants to go down there? And I said, I don't know, because he, he started like getting real fidgety. And she goes, you should ask him. And I said, dad, do you want to go down there with me? And my dad said, yes. 
And we walked down there and Rawl prays this prayer to receive Christ. And my dad just starts weeping. I had never seen my dad weep. And afterwards he says, Matt, I feel so clean. I feel so different inside. And I saw a change in my dad's life. And I'll tell you, I almost gave up hope because from age five to probably age, I don't know, maybe age 20 or 21, my dad, it just seemed like there's no way he's ever going to come to Christ. He seemed as far away from Christ as I can imagine. And I want to encourage you, those people that are in your life right now, don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good because you'll reap in due season if you don't give up. If you don't give up. And if you're struggling with an addiction, don't give up. Just keep getting back up. Just keep getting grace. Just keep going to people that can help you. Just keep bearing one another's burdens. Just keep doing good. Just keep looking at our city. Keep looking at our schools. Keep seeing people not as the enemy, but as sheep without a shepherd. Don't give up. Keep doing good. Don't quit. Don't ever, ever quit. It's what Winston Churchill said at a a graduation announcement. He got up there and they're expecting this incredible speech. And he says, never, never, never give up. And he walks off and everyone's like, yeah, that was the best thing I ever heard in my life. Don't quit. Because it's so easy to quit when we're discouraged. And I've had those discouragements in in 2020. Didn't you? Didn't you just feel like giving up at times? In 2021, sometimes don't you just feel like giving up? Don't give up. Press in. Never, never, never give up. Because God wants to work in our days. And I want my kids to see the good that I've seen. You know, I I grew up as a little kid at the tail end of the Jesus movement. I I almost caught the, the waves of it. But I want my kids to see that. I want them to know that. I want people in this city, I want people in this county to see that. What maybe you experienced, some of you were here maybe in the 70s and 80s. And it's not about looking back. It's about saying, God, would you do it again? The psalmist prays, God, will you not revive us again? God, will you not do it again? In our day, in my time, in my school, in my place, God, will you not do it again? We we absolutely need God to do that work. If we don't see God do a work, we're done. Our nation is done. Our families are done. They're going to splinter. They're going to divide. We won't see them for eternity. We don't get to see the goodness and joy in the people and the friends that we love that don't know Christ. And so God is using you. It's not, don't wait for the next Billy Graham. There's no next Billy Graham. Three years ago, Billy Graham went into eternity. But you know who there is? There's you and there's me. There's us. And God has called us to say, Lord, would you use us? Help us not to grow weary in doing good. And then verse 10 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. That's to Christians and non-Christians. That's to people inside of the church and outside of the church. And then it says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. The household of faith is a word, a term that is meant for family. Family. Do good to family. You and me, we're family. The people that are around you, we're family. The people that are online, we're family. The people that are outside, we're family. We're all family. We have different views on some things. You know, last Christmas, we didn't go down because different family had different views of, of, is it safe for us to gather? But you know what? We're still family. We love each other. I'm not like, man, I need a new family. (laughs) Because my family didn't want to get together for Christmas. I just want to find a family that gets together for Christmas. Hey, do you guys get together for Christmas? You're now my family. No, it's deeper than that. See, we got to see during the fires here in Santa Cruz County, the body of Christ beyond regeneration church to the the greater church come together to do good to all as we had opportunity. Do you realize that um, next Wednesday or two Wednesdays from now, we are going to have a gathering, and we've done this you know, for years. It's the Santa Cruz County Pastors Fellowship. So we get together. We've been doing it in person in the past. The last year, we've been on Zoom almost every month. We are going to be together. Guess who's going to be with us? There's going to be the mayors of the cities in Santa Cruz County that are with us 
because they have seen how much the church has done during the fires. So we come alongside of them. We do good to all, but especially to the household of faith. And what we got to see is when we were here, you know, Covenant Church down the road says, hey, we got a bunch of vegetables. Can you guys use them? We're not going to use them. And like, we're like, yeah, we'll make soup. So bring them over. So we have that. Calvary Chapel Capitola shows up with a truckload full of bottles of water. Uh, Fred Hennis comes from Gateway and says, hey, you know, we're not evacuating, but here's here's a check for $5,000 for supplies. The body of Christ just comes together. When that happens, people see that unity. And what they do is they realize Jesus must be real. God must be real because look at what good we're doing. And we need to not grow weary in doing good. And in 2021, don't hope to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal. Normal is messed up. Like (laughs) normal is kind of messed up a little bit, you know, and the fires came and I was like, this is better than normal. Like it's hard. I get it. I know that people lost homes and there's still people that are struggling, but to see the community come together and the body of Christ come and support, amazing. Let's keep doing that. We have some incredible things that God wants to do this year. To reach out to UC, we got approval to meet at UC Santa Cruz the week that we got the notice in March of 2020. We now go to 10 people, everyone go home and stay home. Do you realize that? That that was a year ago today that we were at a men's retreat with 450 men at Redwood Christian Park. It was a year ago today that, that... You know, Reeve and Jesselyn moved up here in this step of faith to move from the Bible college. What can God do in a year? What does God want to do? And so, yes, give. Give financially. You know, we, uh, Derek just came on to help out like one day a week, and his gift set has freed me up to do some other things that I didn't think I was going to be able to do. By him doing that, I've been able, we're we're praying about a podcast called the True Story Podcast, where we're just doing a podcast about true stories of real people whose lives have been affected by Jesus. Like we want to get out there. We want to get back onto the campus. We're praying that that door remains open. So would you join me in that to say, God, would you, would you do it again in our day? Would you do it now in 2021 when everyone else thinks that the church is on the decline? No, God's people, he's always had a remnant He's always had the the faithful. And what hinders God from saving by many or by few? By many or by few. God wants to work. I encourage you, if you're in junior high school, if you're in high school, let God use you. Take a step of faith. Your friends are thinking about suicide. They're addicted to drugs. You might be struggling. Give them hope that goes beyond this world. God, use me. This is my mission field. If I'm in college, that's your mission field. Where you live, where you work, your family. God, would you pour out your spirit today? Would you do that now in our time now? Because God, we need you. God, hear. God, work. God, minister. God, pour out your spirit. God, help us. God, forgive us. That's the heart that God wants. It's the heart that Jesus came For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's the same plan. It's the same mission. But you and I are alive today for such a time as this. Father God, today we we just... um, God, we, we need you. God, we need you when there is the struggle between the left and the right, between denominations, between races, between countries. God, we just need to hold up Jesus. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to speak the truth, but to speak the truth in love. Help us not to capitulate to the culture when the culture is going every which way it wants to go. God, we we don't live in a relativistic, relativistic way. We don't define good and evil. You do. We don't define good and bad. You know what is best for the human soul. God, you know what what is best for human thriving. God, I just want to pray for my kids right now. Lord, I just lift them up to you. Would you reach them, Jesus? We need you. God, would you fill them with hope? Fill them with joy. Fill them with peace. Fill them with love, God. Lord, would you reach the children that are in elementary school with the truth that 
that God, when they come into this world and the land says, and the people say, they're going to get devoured. And we would be like Joshua and Caleb to say, no, no, this is our bread. Jesus, we pray to you, give us this day our daily bread. And, and we know that you provide for us. We thank you for that. But Lord, we also thank you for the bread of trials, the bread of difficulties that make us resilient and make us strong. God, I thank you even for the heartaches that cause us to relate to you in ways we would never be able to relate to you. Father, I want to pray for the, the widows. God, strengthen them, the widowers. Father, we pray for the orphans. We ask for Foster the Bay and we pray for Royal Family Kids Camp. God, we pray for the social workers. God, we pray for these kids that during this pandemic have been locked up at home, sometimes with people that are abusing them. God, would you free them? Father, we drive by and we see the homelessness and we see the problems with it. But God, we ask for a solution that is beyond governmental. We pray, Father, for salvation. We pray for those that are addicted to give up their addictions. And Lord, when they struggle, that they wouldn't be thrown to the wayside. God, we, I pray today for those that are struggling with the besetting sin that maybe no one else knows about. And they're on that precipice of about ready to commit adultery about ready to leave a marriage, about ready to leave their kids. Lord, about ready to overdose, about ready to do something that is harmful to themselves. Jesus, would you reach them right now? And if that is you, just know God loves you. God, would you encourage the parents, the grandparents, that Lord, when we see our kids the struggles that they're feeling because they have not been in school at times. Lord, because they see the world that seems so chaotic that they're growing up in, would you give them hope and would you draw them? And Lord, use them to reach their peers. And God, we're not waiting for the next Billy Graham, but we pray, use us, use me. Pour out your spirit. God, we thank you. Your grace, your love is so much, it's so good. It's beyond what we deserve. God, thank you for using us as a church beyond our walls to reach people around the world, to, to assist others that don't know you. We pray that they would know that all good things come from you. So today as we sing, God, fill our hearts with joy. Fill our hearts with gladness. Fill our hearts with faith. Fill our hearts with resilience. As we sing, fill us with hope because our hope will not disappoint because it is founded in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to worship, if you are online, I'm gonna be in the, the virtual hangout afterwards. And if you have any prayer requests, I'd love to pray with you. There's a Zoom link that's there. Don't be afraid. You don't even have to turn on your camera. You could just sit in there and listen and you could put a prayer request up in the chat box and we'll pray for you. If you're on Facebook, we just wanna pray for you. If you're on YouTube. Um, God wants to do a work. And so as we worship him, just allow the Holy Spirit to fill you. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus today, today, don't wait. Let today be that day where you say, Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you fill me with your presence? Forgive me. And let us know that you've done that. We'd love to come alongside of you. Let's continue to worship. <laughs>